Welcome everyone to the great city of Irvine and to Second Harvest. Um, here for Dave Min, uh, a very good friend of mine, um, somewhat of a mentor, very much a mentor. Um, Dave has been a true champion of not only Irvine, but for all the communities that he serves. He shares our values by supporting the issues that are so important to all of us alike. He has prioritized public safety, climate action, economic development and innovation, and protecting our open space. Dave has delivered on all the promises that he has made for us. This past year alone, Dave has brought to our region over $31 million in direct investment to Orange County um, for firefighters, for parks, for infrastructure. And he has brought in the city of Irvine alone $14 million to complete the Jost Open Space the Jeffrey Open Space Trail, otherwise known as JOST. So our city and our county could not have a better representative to fight for all the things that are important to us. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce my good friend and state senator, Dave Min. Uh, well, thank you everyone for being here today. Really appreciate you. and. Um, you know, it wouldn't be much of a town hall if I was just speaking to myself. So, uh, thanks, thanks very much. And um, uh, let's just see if I have some notes. Um, so, I just wanted to start with a, a precursor here. Uh, some of you may have seen some news recently that I uh, announced for a different seat, um, a, a campaign for that. Uh, I just want to be clear that uh, today's town hall is going to be exclusively focused uh, on my role in the State Senate and your concerns or questions about my role in the State Senate. This is an official town hall. Uh, it is paid for by the taxpayers, so there will be no discussion of, of any politics uh, or of any other potential campaigns. <clears throat> uh, but with that, I, I do want to thank you for being here today. Uh, I personally believe that political engagement is critical for democracy. If we want to have a vibrant democracy, uh, we need people engaged, so it's, it's really heartening to see you out here today at 9.30 on a Saturday morning. I know there's a lot of other things that I, I would probably rather be doing than uh, attending a town hall, so I really appreciate you. It's, it's, uh, I think it's a sign of the times, and, and uh, I hope we can keep that energy going into our politics. Um, uh, before we get into questions, which is really the heart of what I want today to be about, uh, I did want to just take a few minutes to introduce myself to those of you who don't know me. Uh, talk about what we've been up to in my two plus years in the state senate. Uh, so I am not a career politician. I, I've never had run for anything before 2018. Uh, not dog catcher, not like school president. Uh, I had worked in um, public policy, but, but really thought that running for elections was not something I wanted to do. I, I was never good at selling magazines as a kid, uh, selling anything. And, and so the idea of like selling myself and uh, calling people for donations, things like that, was not anything I ever wanted to be on my resume. And, uh, I actually thought, had what I thought was a pretty respectable job. Some might disagree, uh, but I was a law professor at UC Irvine before coming to serve in the state senate. Uh, zot, zot, zot again. <clears throat> but, um, you know, I, I entered into the political arena because I think we are really at a critical juncture in our country's history. Uh, a lot of the core values that I grew up thinking were the foundation of this country, I believe, are under attack right now. And I think it's, it's so important that we try to turn this country around. For me, it's really personal. Uh, as a son of Korean immigrants who came to this country in 1971, uh, they came here in search of the American dream. Uh, I'm my, the son of immigrants. Um, you know, for me, I remember my parents telling me they grew up during the Korean War and its aftermath. Uh, they grew up at a time when Korea is not the Korea of today. Uh, there was no Squid Games. There, there was no Samsung. Uh, they weren't selling cool cars. Uh, it was a country that was uh, war-torn. They grew up in abject poverty. Food was scarce. Uh, Korea was suffering from the after-effects of the Korean War. Uh, and they came to this country for the graduate studies. Like so many other people, they came here because of what America s stands for. And um, <clears throat> they had me and my brother while they were studying. Uh, and as they tell it to me, um, they were thinking about going back to Korea. Their student visas were expiring right after my brother was born. 
And my dad decided to take an interview at an aerospace company in California who's a mechanical engineering PhD. And uh, kind of just took it on a whim, came out after the interview, which he thought went pretty well, he decided to drive to the beach about an hour away, uh, took off his shoes and socks, bought a fish sandwich from a vendor, and ate his sandwich while he was walking you know, on the coast. And he thought to himself, I can't live anywhere else but here. <laughs> And so we all moved out there. I, I was like two and a half. My brother was a, just born. Uh, and we grew up here. Uh, my brother and I were the product of California public schools. He's a medical doctor. Uh, I'm the black sheep in the family. I'm a, I'm a lawyer now, whatever I do. <clears throat> but, um, you, you know, that's, that's really the story of America and, and the story of California. And, and somewhere in all of our histories, we share that same story. Someone made a decision to leave their home culture, to leave their home country, to come here because of what America has always stood for. And I think right now that it's critical that we restore that American dream because when you talk to a lot of people out there, particularly young people, uh, they don't think America stands for what I think America has always stood for. They don't believe America offers opportunity. Uh, they, they think words like democracy and freedom are just slogans. And I think we have to get back. We have to fight hard to try to make sure that, that we can restore those values. And I think we can still do that. We can still restore American exceptionalism, uh, but it's something that's going to take a lot of hard work to do. It's going to take people like you out there fighting uh, to try to make sure that we get back to the America uh, that, that I believe this country, this flag stands for. Um, now, <clears throat> I am relatively new to being a politician, uh, so I'm just going to tell you my philosophy on governance and, and because I believe in being transparent. Uh, first, I think elected officials should do what they say. They should be transparent. Um, when they make promises, they should try to keep those promises. And so not everyone agrees with everything I've been doing, but I've tried to message very clearly uh, what I stand for. The first bill I introduced when I was elected to the California State Senate was a bill to end gun shows at Orange County Fairgrounds. <clears throat> and again, not everyone agrees with that bill, but that was something I said I would do if I was elected. So that was the first bill I introduced. Uh, since being elected, I have, campaigned, or I've, I have tried to fight for uh, addressing climate change, improving our public schools, helping small businesses, supporting law enforcement, and others. Uh, now, those are not things that everybody agrees with, but those are values and issues that I said I would fight for, uh, and I will continue to fight for those uh, because I believe in being transparent and doing what I say. Uh, second, I think that elected officials should try to do their best to reach out to the constituents they represent to try to listen to their concerns and to do what we can to help uh, because that is ultimately what my job is about. You elected me to represent you and I can't do that effectively if we're not trying to reach out to you. Uh, and that's a big part of what today's town hall is about. Uh, and I want to give a shout out to my district office because they have helped, uh, not just helped, they've been instrumental in, in our outreach. And I'm going to give you some statistics in a moment, but the, the really incredible job. Uh, so I just want to give acknowledgement. I've got Brian C. back there, Brian. I've got Matt Kern back there taking photographs. Uh, Kelly Jones right here. Uh, James Black somewhere. James right there. Uh, Charles Kim. And I have to give a special shout out to my district director, Ash Alvandi, who leads this team. He's incredible. And so since taking office in December 2020, uh, my district staff and I have held over 15, have, this is our 15th town hall. This is our third in-person town hall. We had 12 on Zoom, which is not the same thing as being in person. Uh, I've been the keynote speaker at over 100 events. I've personally participated in over 1,000 meetings with local groups, uh, and the district staff has met with thousands of, had thousands of other meetings. Uh, I've presided over 40 roundtable meetings with different stakeholders, including with interface religious groups, local chambers of commerce, realtors, teachers, students, activists, and different community groups concerned about the rise in hate crimes, for example. We've organized 25 workshops to help constituents, including on issues like fraud targeting seniors, small business uh, resources, and other things like that. Uh, so we, we've been working hard, and the district staff also has been working hard to try to help constituents that need that assistance. Uh, they have resolved over 3,500 constituent issues including helping more than 2,500 people get their EDD unemployment benefits. Now, you may have read that that was a huge mess, uh, and a lot of people were not getting their checks. I have personally talked to many people who my district staff has helped, 
Uh, and that has often, sometimes been life-saving. It's been the difference between being homeless or not, be, between having meals on the table or not. Uh, so really incredible work on behalf of our district staff. So let's give another shout out to them. I also have an incredible staff in Sacramento uh, who are not here because they're working hard on our legislative package for the year. Uh, they've helped us get so much done, and I, I just want to acknowledge some of the work that they've done. Uh, now, when I took office in 2020, Orange County, and this, particularly this part of Orange County, was known for being one of the deserts of taxpayer funding. Uh, we got about six to seven cents back for every dollar you pay to the state. Uh, we've tried to change that. I think we've been very successful in that. Uh, as uh, Vice Mayor Kim mentioned, we have brought back lots of money to the district for different priorities, over $65 million in, in the last two years, uh, including over $30 million to help fight wildfires. There will be a new hand station opening up in the canyon area for OCFA because that's obviously a critical priority is to protect our homes uh, to try to fight wildfires. Uh, $35 million for parks and open spaces, including uh, the Jack Hammett Sports Complex, the T. Winkle Athletic Complex, Fairview, Park Mesa, and Shalimar Park in Costa Mesa. Do we have anyone from Costa Mesa here? Yeah, perfect. Um, the, we have uh, the renovation of Centennial Park in Tustin. Do we have anyone from Tustin here? Perfect. And we have uh, the Jeffrey Open Space Trail connection over the I-5 in Irvine, which uh, May Vice Mayor Kim mentioned. Uh, which, if you're a biker or hiker, that'll allow you to go, it's kind of a long ways, but to go all the way from Cleveland National Forest to our beautiful coastline, which is going to be amazing. You can just, you don't, you can just protect it from traffic, you can just ride or bike or hike, and that's going to be, I think, really amazing for those of us who love the outdoors, and we have such great outdoor spaces here in Orange County. Uh, on the legislative side, um, oh, I should also mention, we were able to pass SB 87 my first year, uh, which brought $3.1 billion dollars to small businesses around the state who are suffering from COVID-19. And that brought over $100 million directly to this area uh, with help for more than 1,000 small businesses. On the legislative side, my staff and I were able to get 17 bills signed into law by the governor. Uh, I'm happy to discuss these in more detail, but some of the ones that we highlight uh, are around gun violence prevention. Uh, and of course, thank you. And unfortunately, we saw, but I don't know if you saw, but we had another mass shooting this morning in Los Angeles. This is a, a chronic, chronic problem, and, and it has to stop. Uh, climate change, helping small businesses, domestic violence, uh, fighting anti-Asian and other forms of hate, protecting women's reproductive rights. These are some of the top priorities for us. <clears throat> We've passed first in the nation laws ending gun shows on state-owned property. Uh, uh, recognizing reproductive coercion as a form of domestic violence and requiring that autonomous vehicles, which we will have at some point in the future, be zero emissions. <clears throat> I'm also proud of a bill that we passed last year, which we'll build on this year, uh, that requires that our public transit agencies, in including here in Orange County, uh, start to study the problem of harassment, particularly around targeted people. Uh, LGBTs, women, Asian Americans, uh, we see a lot of harassment on these, sometimes on the verge of violence, uh, and we have to really get a beat on this with the goal of stopping it. Public transit should feel safe for everybody. Public, safe, public spaces should feel safe for everybody, uh, and right now that's unfortunately not the case. Now, we're just getting started. I should say I, I've got another two years to serve before uh, my term is up, uh, and I'm really excited about my bill package for the upcoming year. Uh, we've already introduced SB 241, which builds on a bill we did last year. So last year we passed a bill that requires that gun stores um, have basic surveillance uh, so that if a gun is stolen um, or, or shoplifted or something, uh, they have some record of who might have done that uh, because that problem, unfortunately, is, is far too prevalent. This year we're trying to pass a bill that would be a companion to that that would require that gun dealers uh, have training for their employees. Uh, to try to recognize and prevent the problem of fraudulent transactions, straw sales, uh, basically selling guns to people who shouldn't have them. There's a lot of times where people will buy guns uh, on behalf of others. That's called a straw sale. So if, if uh, you know, Council Member Tree Cedar right here is, is uh, for some reason, this is clearly not the case, but if she's not able to purchase a gun because she's committed a crime in the past or something, 
Uh, I might, she might ask me, her friend, Senator Min, to go buy uh, some guns on her behalf. And, and that type of straw sales transaction happens a lot. There's some warning signs that law enforcement recognizes can stop that. So that's a bill that we're going to try to pass this year as well. Um, offshore drilling, we had the Huntington Beach oil spill uh, about a year and a half ago. And we saw the devastation that that relatively small spill did to our coastline. Uh, we know these offshore platforms are a ticking time bomb. I did introduce a bill last year. Uh, that bill got held up in a committee because of opposition from the oil industry. Uh, but we're going to reintroduce that this year to try to end offshore drilling immediately. Um, I've got a bill that uh, I know there's, uh, I love e-bikes. I have a scooter, an electric scooter in Sacramento, which is how I get to work. Uh, but I think there's also a growing problem of e-bikes that go really, really fast and not really having rules of the road. I, I don't know what to do about the problem, but we've heard a lot from constituents who have concerns about, you know, like you got these like 12 year old kids. Uh, my kid's not one of them yet. Uh, but they, they, you know, they, you, they're riding their bikes. They don't really have training. They don't really have responsibility. Uh, what should we do about that? Should there be insurance requirements? Should there be licensing requirements? Uh, we don't really have a beat on this, so what we're doing is asking for the DMV or someone else to think about what the rules of the road should be. What, what are the best practices when it comes to e-bike regulation so that we have a platform or blueprint going forward on, on what to do about it, if anything. Uh, we also have, uh, you know, and I mentioned climate change is an important priority of mine. Uh, we're going to be looking to ask the major agency, CARB, uh, California Air Resources Board, to develop a blueprint for decarbonizing medium and heavy duty transportation. Right now that blueprint does not exist, uh, surprisingly. Uh, so one of our bills will call on them to do that so that we can start really aggressively figuring out what to do with trucks and buses and things like that. Um, a bill that I am very proud of, uh, particularly given some of the recent tragedies we've seen, would be calling on uh, a bill that would require that any financial institution that wants to do business with the state of California be fully divested from investments or business with guns. <clears throat> and I, I think this is important because that bill, if it is passed, will help drive capital out of the gun industry. And right now, a lot of the propaganda that we see around guns, uh, more guns is safer, all that, it, it comes from the gun industry and it comes from uh, Wall Street, essentially. So if we f start to force Wall Street to divest, uh, I think that will be an important step towards uh, really putting the gun safety deba debate on equal playing ground where it should be around facts and, and not propaganda. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of other bills I could mention, but I won't for the purposes of time. Uh, I did just want to uh, mention a few other things before I take questions. Uh, first, my committee assignments. Uh, we got new committee assignments at the beginning of this year, uh, and I have some really heavy ones, so I'm going to be very, very busy this year. Uh, but I sit on the Energy Committee, uh, I sit on Judiciary, Banking, I was proud to be named Chair of the Natural Resources and Water Committee, which is, thank you, that is critically important for dealing with a lot of the major issues we're seeing right now around wildfires, droughts, flooding, and our protected open spaces. Uh, one of the things we'll be doing in the next month or so is a hearing on the 30 by 30 plan. Do you guys know what 30 by 30 is? Uh, how many don't know what 30 by 30 is? Okay. It's not an ESPN documentary or anything like that. 30 by 30 is the goal to get 30% of our space, our physical space, to be protected open space by the year 2030. And we here in California have set that goal for ourselves through legislation. Uh, it's one of the reasons we've created open spaces like uh, the Banning Ranch open space, which I was happy to co-author last year. Um, but the problem is that there's actually no benchmarks or targets for 30 by 30. And so we're kind of just muddling along right now. So what we're trying to do is hold a hearing to figure out, okay, what are the actual steps we need to take so that when 2029 rolls around, we're not just saying, oh, we're, we're like really far from our goal. We're not going to meet it. What are the interim benchmarks that we need? What are the progress steps that we need to, to get to that goal? Uh, so we'll be holding that hearing and potentially introducing legislation as well. Uh, I also sit, finally, on the Budget Committee, and I sit on the Education Subcommittee for that. I'm one of four members on that Education Subcommittee. And I did want to say a few things on the budget, because I'm sure you've all heard about our budget situation. It is not a good-looking budget situation. Uh, we are looking at something around a 20 to $25 billion decline in revenues from last year. Um, could be higher if there's a recession. Um, 
the governor is predicting something like 18 billion, and he just introduced his budget back in or a little earlier this month. Uh, the legislative analyst's office, which is our nonpartisan uh, analyst, uh, predicts it might be a little higher, probably around 25 billion. So that's kind of the range we're looking at. Uh, right now, the governor's budget uh, does not propose any major cuts. Uh, what he proposes instead is a reliance on what's called deferred spending, where we take things that we we're supposed to spend on, and instead of spending it in the near future, we kind of wait a few years to see what happens. Uh, and then something called trigger cuts, uh, which is uh, a term describing cuts that are made that may be restored in subsequent years if funding becomes available, either through increased revenues or because of federal funding, such as might happen through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act or anything else. So sorry this is all technical, but it, the budget is very technical. And we have an $80 billion budget, so it's, it's quite large and complex here in California. Uh, again, we have 40 million people, so we are, and as you probably heard, the fourth largest economy in the world. Uh, so we're looking at a pretty complex economy, pretty complex budget, uh, and there's a lot of moving parts. Uh, the short way of saying what the governor's doing is that he's kind of relying on a little bit of smoke and mirrors right now. He wouldn't use that term. His, his staff wouldn't use that term. But, but really what they're doing is kind of, uh, you know, taking some short-term things, measures, to hope, hope in, in the hopes that in coming years we'll have a better budget situation. Uh, the real question is what happens if these declines in revenue are longer lasting. If they last three years or five years, uh, we start to look at more painful cuts. Um, we are, so the, and I should explain the budget process. The governor's budget is the first proposed budget. The Senate Budget Committee, which I sit on, and the Assembly Budget Committee, uh, we will have our say. And so what happens is a tri-party negotiation over the coming months. We'll get back to him and, and he will then propose a May revise, a revised budget. At that point in time, we'll have a better sense of what our revenues look like. And then the final budget will be uh, finalized sometime in August or September. Uh, we'll all vote on it at that point. And I'll just tell you right now, I think it's too early to speculate about what's going to happen. Uh, but I do think that we need to be thinking longer term about what the budget situation looks like. What are our long-term priorities and, and not be myopically focused on this year. Um, and in, in the education subcommittee, uh, I think one of the core things we need to do is focus on class size and quality teachers. And, and that's, thank you. <laughs> That's been one of my priorities in my time in the Senate. Uh, I've had countless meetings. When I mentioned I had over 1,000 meetings, uh, a lot of those were with PTA, with superintendents, with school board trustees, because I think it's really critical for us to try to understand what our regional priorities are. I'm not here to represent LA County. I'm here to represent Orange County. And I think Orange County has different needs than LA or San Francisco or Santa Clara. Uh, so I've tried to fight for those priorities, which my school districts have been very clear in telling me are our priorities. It's about making sure that our base budgets are higher. Uh, there are great programs around things like expanded access and equity. Those are important, but I think at the end of the day, what's most important to my school districts uh, is that we make sure that, again, it's, it's smaller class size, uh, acquiring and retaining uh, high quality teachers, which is a real challenge during COVID and beyond. Uh, so that's something that we'll keep emphasizing. Um, look, budgets are a reflection of our values. And one of the things I think here in California and, and really in this country that we have not emphasized enough is that long-termism. Uh, now, a lot of you heard me say this quote before, but I'm gonna say it again because it really it, it highlights my own values. Uh, a civilization's great when its elders plant trees whose shade they know they will never sit in. And I really think we have to emphasize that idea of, of planting trees, of investing in the long-term, uh, even if it means that in the short-term we might have some different priorities. Uh, so I think that's really critical. Um, and I'll keep fighting for that budget, and I'm sure we'll give you updates going forward about what the budget situation looks like, uh, where we might be having to look to pare back. Uh, but with that, I just want to thank you for being here, and I look forward to your questions. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for pre-submitting your questions. We have quite a few of them, so I'm going to ask the audience to help me uh, read them and pick from this box randomly. And we can start with Council Member Kathleen Tresider. Okay, Sid from Irvine asks, oh, this is climate, good. Climate, for the global climate crisis and green energy emerging around the world, what is your plan to promote anything to help the community forward with energy-related issues? I'm sorry, could you say that again, the last part? 
What is, um, your what is your plan to promote anything to help the community forward with energy-related issues? Got it. Um, so climate is a complicated issue. Uh, now, the goal here is to, and I should say, I, I was at the COP conference, which is the United Nations uh, climate conference in the Middle East earlier this year. I learned a lot about climate change and some of the different policy levers that are being pulled around the world. Uh, but, but we know that we are on track right now to really have transformative changes in our climate and temperature. Uh, these, the, we're just really seeing the beginning of this. The storms, the floods, the rising sea level, the droughts, uh, this is just really the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. Uh, we're going to be facing some pretty massive changes to our way of life. Uh, and that's even assuming that we change course pretty immediately on our carbon emissions, which we're not. So the goal that has always been set by the United Nations and climate scientists is that we get to zero emissions economy, that we're not burning any fossil fuels, that we're not emitting carbon and carbon-related gases into the atmosphere by the year 2045. Now, the consensus is becoming that we're probably not going to meet that as a, as a, as a, as a globe and civilization. Uh, but we've got to keep pushing as aggressively as we can while also making sure that we're not leaving people behind, that we're not condemning people to poverty in the process. Uh, and that's a challenge. Uh, it, it's tough to do. Here in California, and, and we're seen as one of the global leaders, uh, we're not on track to meet that goal as well. Uh, so we have set a lot of targets here in the state. Uh, we codified the 2045 zero emission standard last year into law. Uh, but that's not going to be enough. I think what we have to do is make sure that we're innovating, because really the only way that we're going to get to zero emissions by 2045 is, is with a lot of green innovation. And I, th I think that's something that we can do. So people don't realize this, but we're actually pretty close uh, to, to an economy where we might be able to have zero emissions. There's some amazing stuff being developed right now. Uh, the major challenge today is getting enough stuff online that's renewable, and, and then making sure that it's available at the right times of day. So you probably heard about uh, peak demand versus peak supply. There's something called the duck curve. So there's a duck curve thing where it looks like a duck, but basically it's the net energy usage versus supply from renewables. And there's, in the evenings and early mornings when there's not sunlight, uh, in California we face a gross imbalance in renewable supply versus demand. Uh, that's also seasonal. So in the late summer, in September, we know that we have peak demand. Uh, and, and that's also a problem. So you remember last year when we got those text messages saying you have to turn off your lights, uh, reduce your energy usage, or we're going to see rolling blackouts throughout the state. Uh, that was a problem with us not having enough energy online to meet the demands. And with the summers getting hotter, with some of the electric lines going down because of wildfires, uh, our challenges are being exacerbated. Uh, so one of the big things right now that we're focused on is long duration storage. How do we get enough batteries or other storage in place so that when we turn on the lights at 5 p.m., or turn on the air conditioning at 5 p.m. Uh, in, in August or September, that that actually works. Uh, and so storage is the answer, because solar may not be available in, in quantities that we need. Storage, if we can store that energy, though, we produce the energy and store it so that it's available uh, when we need it, uh, that, that's going to be what we look at. And so storage is something that a lot of folks are working on. Uh, there's a lot of complicated and interesting things. Uh, we're actually working on one bill right now that I'm co-authoring that's a vehicles-to-grid uh, idea. But uh, you know those electric vehicles that are... You know, how many of you guys have a Tesla electric vehicle? So uh, those electric vehicles, in theory, can go two-way. So they can charge up from the grid, but during peak hours, they can also actually be sources of energy. They can actually charge two ways. And, and imagine that could be a huge source of energy when we need it. Imagine if you were able to get paid money, like real hard cash, for hooking up your car to your electric car to the grid and actually reversing it and, and charging the grid during peak hours. And that's the basic idea. We've got an idea that would basically start to push manufacturers to allow for two-way charging more easily. Uh, but this is not science fiction. The, the technology is already there. There's a lot of solutions like that that are in the works, and, and that's something we're work, working on. Now, since I got to office in 2020, one of the things I have emphasized over and over to the governor, to my colleagues in the legislature, is that we need to do more to spur private capital into green innovation. Uh, they rely a lot on mandates. Uh, I call this the eight-minute abs problem, if you saw something about Mary. But uh, you know, a lot of my colleagues, and, and I love them, um, but they think the answer is more, an aggressive, more aggressive mandates. 
Uh, so instead of 2045, maybe the goal should be to do a mandate that we are zero emissions by 2040 or 2035. So what's better than eight minute abs, seven minute abs, six minute abs? Uh, and that's all great in theory, but mandates alone can't solve the problem. I do think we need private capital to invest. We, we need it coming in. And I've always made the pitch that this part of Orange County would be ideal to be a green innovation center. We have a lot of comp great companies here already. Uh, Irvine knows about them. We've got uh, Rivian, the electric truck manufacturer. We've got a clean fusion company here, Tri Alpha Energies, that's amazing. A lot of solar manufacturers, a lot of long duration storage folks, a lot of startups out here. Uh, we have great weather, great climate, and we're a lot cheaper than places like Silicon Valley. So why not Orange County? Uh, but we have to start by actually incentivizing private capital to come here. Uh, so we were able to get a modest tax incentive last year uh, for green companies that are headquartered in California. I think that's a good start. It's about $100 million, uh, but I think we need to do a lot more to make sure that we're bringing private capital in. Uh, we also need to do more on direct research and development. I think that's important for UCs, for, for institutions like USC and Stanford. Uh, how can we spur our researchers, our scientists, uh, to do more and more aggressive work in this area? Because that's going to be important. Uh, I think we can turn this around, but it's going to require a concerted effort. Now, people talk about a Green New Deal. I actually think the better analogy for this is a Green Apollo project, which is when we decided as a country that we wanted to get someone on the moon, we, we set that goal, we made it a national priority, we put real targeted funds into that, and not only did we, did, did we get a man on the moon within 10 years, it was actually within seven years. And, and I think if we collectively put our uh, energy, our focus on solving the climate crisis in this country, we, we can get to that. Thank you, next question, Commissioner Hamid. I should also mention we have some uh, other folks I want to highlight in the crowd, including Irvine Council Member Kathleen Tresseter. We have Katie McEwen from Irvine Unified School District, newly elected trustee. Uh, we have Commissioner Naz Hamid from the Planning Commission, a Community Services Commission of Irvine. Uh, and we have staff and representatives from uh, my colleague Assemblywoman Cotty Petrie Norris's office, uh, Mike. Uh, from Orange County Supervisor Katrina Foley's office, Adam, uh, and from Irvine Mayor Farrah Khan's office, Miriam. Sorry, go ahead. All right, so this is a question about business. We had some people ask about the number of people and businesses leaving California over the past few years. What are you doing to help businesses to stay and thrive in California? No, that's a great question. Um, and I think, so I've been told by people that I, whose opinion I respect that for the first time in ever, we're actually starting to see high net worth individuals leave the state of California. Uh, and I mentioned this to some of my colleagues and they just kind of laughed. And they said, people have been saying that for 40 years, it's not true. Uh, but I do think things are changing and, and I think we need to be mindful particularly in this state where I think it's something like two-thirds of our tax revenue comes from the top 1% of our um, wealth earners. We are very, very high-end right now. And I, I realize that you know, a lot of folks want progressive tax policy. California already has a very progressive tax structure. We are not a country, which means that people can leave our state, businesses can leave our state to go to other states. Uh, I think we have to be mindful uh, of not killing the golden goose because as someone who has, uh, considers myself a progressive, who has strong progressive values, we can't fund progressive priorities unless we have a strong tax base. And I worry that, um, you know, like I agree with a lot of the policy priorities that we've passed in this state, but sometimes I think that my colleagues are a little uh, laissez-faire when it comes to thinking about the concerns of small businesses, of individuals who make money. Um, and I think their attitude is they've got a lot of money, we can take more of it. And I think at some point, you know, people love this state. It's an incredible state to live in, but if we keep pushing too hard uh, on regulation, on taxes, uh, we will drive people out of the state, and I think we're starting to see that happen. So uh, as far as what I'm doing, I, I could give you a whole bunch of examples, but uh, within the room, uh, on votes, I've tried to fashion myself as someone who's a voice, particularly for small businesses. And, and one of the arguments I've made is that Small businesses in this state, it's a really hard deal. You need a compliance consultant basically to open a lemonade stand. 
uh, because there are so many overlapping regulations coming from different agencies that we in the legislature have passed over the last 40, 50 years. Uh, and we ought to streamline this. We ought to make it easier. Okay, yes, I believe in workplace safety. Yes, I believe in preventing harassment and making sure that workers have a strong living wage. Uh, but at the same time, we could be doing more within the con confines of those values, of those priorities, of, of trying to make it easier as far as compliance uh, and some of the other ways in which we can help small businesses. Uh, so I've kind of viewed my role in my time in the Senate uh, as part of the majority party, the party that does pass a lot of these types of bills uh, and rules, as trying to temper them, to try to represent within the room a compromise. Because a lot of these bills are going to pass regardless of whether I vote yes or no. And so my predecessor was a Republican. He voted no on the, all these bills. Uh, and that didn't impact anything because it was just another no vote from a minority party in the state that's a super minority. Uh, what I've tried to do instead is within the room, argue for the interests of, of my constituents of the small businesses I represent and say, hey, we, we need to change this up. Can, can we add the following? So we've been in constant contact with the local chambers of commerce um, and, and trying to advance their interests by changing up some of these bills. So we've had some controversial bills. I voted no on some, I've stayed off of some, I voted for some, uh, but with all of them I've tried to make it so that they are less onerous on businesses, that they're reflecting some of the concerns that are raised to me, uh, and that's how I view my voice and my role in the State Senate. That's great. It's going to go down the line. Who wants to read a question? There you are. <laughs> Hi, Dave. What's the outlook for improving our climate grade? Do we have a comprehensive climate action plan, as noted in the recent Line Crassium uh, something report? Is there any plan to address crime in Irvine? Oh my gosh, also concerned about the rising utility costs. Thank you very much. So I think there are three questions there. The first is whether it's a climate action plan. I think that refers to Irvine or Orange County. Uh, the state, of course, has numerous climate action plans, including a scoping plan that was just developed by the Air Resources Board uh, to try to get us to a reduction of greenhouse gases of 40 percent by the year 2030. Uh, and that is something that we're, is, we're going to start seeing roll out. That was something that was passed in legislation a few years ago, right before I joined the state Senate. Uh, so that's, that's an important part of our climate plan at the state. I can't speak to the city of Irvine or Orange County, but um, I'm hopeful that they will uh, proceed that way. I, I do think, you know, I look to my colleagues in the Irvine City Council, and I know that we have some really strong uh, pro-science climate view voices on that council. Uh, the third question, I think, or there are three. There's the second question was, is there any plan to address crime in Irvine? Um, I think that's an Irvine-specific question. Uh, when it comes to the state, um, uh, of course, like many others, I'm, I'm concerned about the rise in, in crime that we're seeing in this state. Um, you know, I, I try to take a, a, a balanced view. I think uh, I'm really good friends with uh, the senator from San Francisco, Scott Weiner. Uh, but Scott likes to propose decriminalization as the answer for everything. Uh, and, and while I am sympathetic you know, to, to some of the concerns around uh, over-incarceration, around uh, inequitable policing, around some of the issues that, that I think he wants to represent, I also think it's first and foremost we have to make sure all communities feel safe from crime. Uh, and I do think that, that we've got to address that. So um, both in the room and, on the, and with my votes, I've tried to reflect that view and at the state level, I've, I've tried to be an advocate for public safety. What was the third question? The third question was about the rise in utility costs, uh, specifically natural gas increases. Yeah, so we've seen a massive increase in natural gas costs. Uh, and the reasons for that are, are various, but I think the number one driver is uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, which has taken two major sources of natural gas offline for much of the developed world. Uh, so in Europe right now, as I understand it, their natural gas prices are seven times the price of ours. Uh, now that's still cold comfort to folks that are seeing a 3x increase in their natural gas prices here in California or the rest of the United States. Uh, but first and foremost, this is a global problem. Uh, the second aspect of this is that domestically, uh, our local natural gas providers have chosen to underinvest in new exploration 
and drilling. Uh, instead, they've taken the record profits they've made over the last few years, and they've done stock buybacks, new dividends, and you've seen some of the headlines around companies like Chevron and Exxon uh, choosing that path. Uh, and I think that's Wall Street pressure. They want to get some money back in their pockets. Uh, but I think um, you know, that, that's probably a bigger problem than we can address in California. Uh, these are outside of my control, but obviously I empathize, and we'll see what we can do to try to address this. I do think one thing that this whole uh, issue of higher natural gas prices does illustrate pretty clearly is the need for energy resiliency and independence. And, and getting back to what I was saying earlier, we just, I think we need to invest right now uh, big time. And, and I was pl really pleased to see the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act because we need to start investing in infrastructure for a renewable economy. Uh, that means more solar, more wind, uh, the electric grid to transmit that to places. Uh, we need to think about heat storage as well. Heat storage is important, but again, we, we need to figure out how we augment our energy supply so that we're not just reliant on, on a couple sources that are very variable in pricing. Uh, this is obviously the, not the first time we've seen spikes in fossil fuel prices. Uh, Jimmy Carter, I was very young back then, but uh, he lost his election, as I understand it, in large part because of the spike in gas prices uh, that really he had no control over. So I think if we want to be energy and independent in this state, we have, in this country, we have a lot of work to do. Our next question. Good morning, Senator. Yeah. Hi. Oh. Housing. Good one. We had quite a few questions about the, both the housing and homelessness crisis. Can you discuss some of your visions and what the state is doing to meet the housing needs of those living in California? <clears throat> yeah, housing is, uh, the cost of housing I think is, there's, there's a lot of important issues that I think about. The cost of housing and homelessness, which in my mind are interrelated, are probably the number one threat to California's economic uh, viability going forward. Um, right now, yes, so I mentioned that high net wealth individuals are maybe f for the first time, I think, ever actually leaving the state. Uh, we've faced a problem of exodus for some time now, and when we poll this, when we do surveys, it, it's not the taxes or regulation, that is a problem, but the number one reason people are leaving the state of California is the high cost of housing. Uh, and we are seeing private equity, so I, this sign says corporate greed is taking over my home. Uh, we are seeing some of that as a problem of, of investors investing in homes that they're not living in. Uh, this is not owner-occupied. Um, but there's a housing supply problem fundamentally in this state. Uh, there's not enough building and there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, but I have tried aggressively to make sure that we have more housing in the state, more housing at all levels, not just for low income but for workforce and just more housing. And that, that's been a little controversial because there are a, a lot of communities I represent that don't like more housing and there's a sort of phrase of not in my backyard, and there's a lot of folks that, you know, they want to keep and retain the quality of their communities, and, and I have tried to be mindful of that, but at the end of the day, we do need more housing. Uh, so I, I'm proud to have been supported 100% by the Yes in My Backyard or YIMBY movement because of my housing record. <clears throat> I do think we, we need to do more to ensure housing because I, I worry that my kids will not be able to live in California. Uh, certainly not in Orange County, and that's a problem we're facing right now is young people, young companies are increasingly looking elsewhere just because you can't afford a million dollars. Uh, if you were going to buy a three-bedroom home right now, and I, I, can, I, I have young friends that are doing this, I, I believe the starting cost right now is about $1.1, $1.3 million to live in Orange County. Uh, so what's your other option? You move to Riverside, Corona, you commute, and you have that heinous commute into Orange County. Uh, and even then, you're not looking at something that's cheap. It's, it's you know, maybe 800000 750, right? I was in St. Louis uh, not too long ago, and I was looking at homes there, and you can get a mansion, literally a mansion, for $400,000. You can get a starter home for about 125000 And that's, when you look at California's market in comparison, it's nuts, and there's, there's a reason. That's a, a primary reason why people are considering other states to live in. So we have to do a lot to address that. Uh, it's a complicated issue because... Uh, there's a lot of interest groups that are really invested against more housing or, or uh, against addressing some of the factors that make housing so expensive and hard to build here in the state. But we really just have to keep pushing. And so I'll be looking to support a number of other pro-housing bills this year, uh, but, but it is a, a priority of mine.
Would you like to? Oh, hey. How are you? I didn't recognize. Good to see you. Hello. Good morning. Hello, Senator Min. How are you? Councilwoman Gutierrez from the city of Orange. Thank you. I would love to read a, a question here. Let me see. I take my glasses off. Oh. <laughs> What can be done to advance public transit in California? Light rail and high speed rail are needed to address air pollution and global warming. Tom Osborne from Laguna Beach. Great question. Thank you. Uh, were you able to hear that? Um, what can we do to do more transit? When I, when I came into office, I had all these grand ideas of, of doing more transit in Orange County. Uh, I, I reached out to cities like Irvine, Huntington Beach, uh, Costa Mesa. And I said, can we do more? Can we do like a regional light rail, maybe from the airport to some selected hubs? And I actually got some interest. Huntington Beach's mayor and, and city council at the time uh, were very excited. They were like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We'd love to have a light rail from the airport to Huntington Beach. Um, but then I started talking with uh, OCTA, started talking with my colleagues, and realized that this is, it's hard. It's hard because it, it, you have right away problems, you have funding. Uh, so I think this is going to take a concerted push, not just from one legislator, but from a group of us. Uh, and it's going to be really a 10, 20 year fight. Uh, and, and that's hard for me to say because I, I thought maybe I could get elected and start making change. But uh, we have to find funding. We have to get the, the county players on board and not everyone in the county wants any kind of public transit. Um, so I, I think we have a lot of work to do. One of the things I will say is that we just had our first ever Orange County-wide delegation meeting, where we just sat down over breakfast and talked about our priorities. And one of those priorities was transit. And you'd be surprised, but it's actually a bipartisan consensus. Uh, my Republican colleagues, my Democratic colleagues, we all agreed we want to do more on transit. Now, probably some of the particulars we might disagree on, but there's at least consensus that we want to emphasize public transit in this county. And I think that's hopefully a start. And if we all work together going forward, uh, we think we'll have the political power to start actually pushing this forward. And, and so, you know, stay tuned. It'll, it'll probably outlast my time in the California State Senate, uh, but we are kind of working towards that goal. Uh, the other thing I should say is we have to make public transit usable, safe, and efficient. And, and so I look at the, uh, the high-speed rail, and, and we know that it was a debacle. It's overpriced. No one's riding it. And, and the problem was that they put it in the middle of nowhere. Right, it's right in the middle of the state in a, in a line that very few people will ever use. Uh, and then they thought they would build it out between San Francisco and LA. And it's not clear to me that that project will ever be completed just because the cost overruns at the off onset were so high that I think they've lost any political support for that. Uh, I think high-speed rail is a great idea. If you've been to other countries, it, it's really cool. I'd much rather take a high-speed rail to go up to San Jose or San Francisco or Sacramento than to jump on a plane. But, and that's clearly feasible in other countries, but unfortunately for political and other reasons, it's, it's not as frequent here in the United States and in California. Uh, but I think if we're, we're reimagining how high-speed rail works, why not start with a line between here in San Diego or here in um, LA? We're gonna have to reroute the Caltrans, um, the, the Amtrak rail uh, around San Clemente. And that's one of the things we in Orange County are very cognizant of, but, uh, that is, uh, because of erosion, uh, something that is not stable at this point. So you may remember it was uh, halted for a couple weeks while they were underpinning the foundation. Uh, but that's a temporary fix. We know that we're going to have to actually reroute that significantly for it to be safe for rail travel going forward. Uh, as we think about that, though, and, and uh, allocate the funding for that, why not just think about uh, maybe a parallel track or track that is uh, amenable to high speed? Because how cool would it be if you could go to San Diego in like 30 minutes or an hour and not have to drive and be in traffic on the five, and you want to go catch a Padres game or go to uh, the zoo or something, you could just jump on the train. Uh, I think that would be very, very popular, very well traveled, uh, and that's the type of thing that I think will make transit uh, something that is attractive to people. The challenge of transit, of any kind of public transit, is getting people to ride it, getting people out of their habits, right? How do you get people out of their cars saying, public transit is something I want to take. Right? If you live in New York City or in Europe, that's something that's very natural. You, you think of public transit as a, a place you're going to go. Here in California, people are not accustomed to that, so we have to get them in a place where they feel comfortable with that. The other part of this is making people feel safe. I took my kids to uh, L.A. Uh, a few months back. We, went on, uh, we were going to a ball game, and we uh, were on uh, Caltrans, or I guess the, uh, the train. And some guy was there who was clearly drugged out, uh, he was staring at my, my son for like a long time, very uncomfortable. 
uh, we started walking away. We just figured we should move. And, and it turns out, as he walked past us and followed us for a little bit, he had a whole bunch of weapons, knives. It looked like a, a, a shotgun. Uh, we, we alerted security. But that's a type of incident that happens all the time on public transit. Uh, unfortunately, my experience was, was very common. And it's even more common if you're, as I mentioned earlier, someone who seems like you're part of a vulnerable community. Minorities, women, LGBT uh, members are, are very frequently targeted for harassment on public transit. So we have to make public transit safe. Uh, and again, that was one of the goals of, of the bill we introduced and that we'll be introducing a, a companion bill to this year. Next question right here. Anne, this is from Anne, Canyon Dems. What can state government do to help cities create safe bike lanes with barriers for e-bike transportation? It's a great question. What, what can government do to make biking safer? Um, I was proud to support a uh, push by Costa Mesa last year, uh, which is very cutting edge. A, a Costa Mesa right now, Arliss Reynolds, councilwoman, is very pro-bike, and she's really pushing for active transportation networks. And one of the things we were trying to find funding for last year, it was one of my top priorities, which unfortunately was not granted, was funding to help um, Costa Mesa build out protected bike lanes uh, in, in key parts of their downtown er, uh, area. And, and I think that would be important because it, right now, if you ride a bike as transportation, it's very unsafe. You're very likely to get hit. And the problem of e-bikes, or maybe not the problem, but the addition of e-bikes adds another challenge because uh, you know, some e-bikes go very fast, and if you're in a bike lane and someone's going, say, 25 miles an hour, and you on your non-electric bike are going maybe 12 to 15 miles an hour, uh, that creates its own problems. So we have to think about biking going forward with, with different speeds. And that's one of the reasons we uh, push for our study bill is just to figure out how we might uh, encourage the implementation and, and purchases of, of e-bikes while making it safe for all bikers. Uh, so we'll keep pushing. Uh, I'd love to hear ideas, but, but it's something that we're thinking about how we can do. Hi. What can you do to support well, public transportation? We already have that one. <laughs> hey, Jill. This comes from Steve. Gas prices. Will the Senate investigate possible gas price manipulation because of reports that many refineries were scheduling maintenance at the same time? Um, I believe there are multiple hearings uh, that are occurring right now, not in the, any of the committees I'm on. Um, and then, but, but there are hearings happening in both the Assembly and State Senate. I, I believe there's also congressional hearings, and I think that the Attorney General is looking into this. Uh, right now, I'd say I think from my perspective, the verdict is still out. Uh, I think the best case anyone's made to me so far is that the timing looks suspicious, but um, you know they don't have a smoking gun, so to speak. Um, it, relatedly, and this was not the question, but there is a windfall profits, uh, I don't know if you call it a tax or a penalty, um, that has been proposed by the governor that we will be reviewing in the state legislature later this year. And on the... <clears throat> And on the energy committee that I sit on, we will be reviewing this. So uh, I am concerned, of course, uh, and this is what we'd call an oligarchic industry, right? It's, it's just a handful of players. There's five refineries in the state uh, that are responsible for our supply. Uh, and we've seen huge spikes in price that were not seen around the country. Uh, and so that is unusual. Uh, at the same time, California's gas blend requirements uh, mean that we have a thin market. It, the gas that's provided in Nevada or Georgia is not the gasoline that can be used here in the state. So they're, you know, the oil company's argument is it's the refinery capacity and all that. It's, it's California's own laws. Uh, I, I think we need to sort of investigate this. Uh, as, as far as the windfall profits tax, uh, it's something I'll be looking at. Now, I want to make sure we're not being counterproductive. And so one of the things I, I want to think about is, you know, maybe if the oil companies, and one of the arguments they've made is they've lost money over five years, right? And then the sixth year, they have windfall profits. Uh, to me, that's like not the worst argument in the world. They, they do need, we do need to make sure that they're investing in their infrastructure so that gas prices don't continue to go up in the state. And that's something I want to be mindful of as well. Uh, but uh, that, that's something we'll closely consider. The governor's pushing it hard and, and stay tuned for how we end up voting on that.
Oh, great. Uh, this one seems to be about uh, your re recently introduced SB241. Uh, what is it and why is it? I think I explained that earlier, but that's, that's the bill that uh, requires that gun dealers uh, have some kind of training for their employees. Uh, and it's similar to what we do for bartenders. Bartenders right now requ are required to have training to make sure they don't over-serve drunk patrons or serve underage people. Uh, the idea is similar. We want to make sure that if you're selling guns, you're not selling guns to people that are going to commit crimes or give those guns to people who might commit crimes. This one's also a long one. Uh, essentially, what is your stance on affirmative action? Uh, where do you stand on the issue of merit versus racial preferences? Merit versus racial preferences? Uh, so I, I think that the affirmative action debate is actually really misunderstood in this country because uh, if you remember, I used to be on the faculty of UC Irvine, and uh, I taught, um, I was actually on the admissions committee for two years there. Uh, affirmative action has not been allowed at UCs in, in quite a long time, full stop, right? So the question is whether race can be used as a factor in admissions. Uh, now, the debate was ended when the Supreme Court a few years ago said you can't use that anymore. So there is no more affirmative action. That, that's just full stop. But yet this keeps getting brought up um, because there are people that would like to avoid having any diversity in any key settings. And I think it's a total red herring because affirmative action does not exist in the places people claim it exists. Uh, the question I think that, that is of merit, though, is do we want diversity in our boardrooms, in our classrooms? Uh, and I think the answer is yes. Because if everyone looks like us, everyone's had our same background, everyone thinks like us, uh, we're losing a lot there. When I go out in the society, when I'm here, I have, I have diversity. I have to deal with people that are different than me, that grew up in different backgrounds than me. Uh, and if I don't have that training, I don't have those experiences, uh, either in college or in the workplace or anywhere else, uh, that makes me worse off. There's also, by the way, a lot of empirical evidence that people are doing, whether in business schools, economic schools, law schools, that very clearly shows that diversity is very, very correlated with better outcomes. If you're a company and you have a diverse board, you're gonna be a more profitable company. If you're a college campus and you have no, a more diverse student body, your students will go on to do better. And, and there's obvious reasons for that, including avoiding groupthink, uh, you know, having diverse experiences in the room. Uh, I like to think I'm a smart guy, but sometimes people who come from different backgrounds than me will point out things to me I'd never thought of. And, and that has a lot of value. So I think that's my answer to that. Affirmative action doesn't exist, but diversity is really important, and I, I believe we should continue emphasizing it. Hello. Hi. Um, as a personal aside, Pat Filler from Costa Mesa, uh, Senator Mint, thank you for hosting this. It's my first time coming. Fantastic. Um, I will encourage my other friends to attend these in the future. Question from Dave, what is your, what do you, um, what do you think of the Second Amendment? <laughs> to be clear, that's not me, Dave. I assume that's a different Dave. <clears throat> I think the Second Amendment is, is part of our core constitution. And so it's, um, you know, the First Amendment's there, and, you know, the, the Fourth Amendment's there. There's a whole bunch of amendments to our constitution that were passed. Uh, as someone who taught law but not constitutional law, uh, I have a somewhat informed view that's not, I'm not a leading constitutional expert, but I've, I've, I know enough leading constitutional experts that I can tell you fairly firmly that until about 15 years ago, the idea that the Second Amendment clearly encompassed an individual right to bear arms was seen as very controversial and not backed by the history of the Second Amendment. <clears throat> But when the Supreme Court decided in, I think, 2005 in the Heller decision that there, the Second Amendment did encompass an individual right to bear arms, we have to work around that. Um, and, and that is the way courts work. Um, but that being said, I, I, a few comments. First, the Second Amendment is not limitless. The First Amendment, which everyone will agree, anyone who knows anything about constitutional law will tell you, the First Amendment, which does not have a well-regulated language, is is much more robust than the Second Amendment right. And the First Amendment right is of, to free speech is not seen as limitless. So when we talk about uh, First Amendment, uh, there's a famous saying from Louis Brandeis, former Supreme Court Justice who is now dead, um, you know, you can't yell, the First Amendment does not protect your right to yell fire in a crowded theater. Uh, there are lots of limitations on the First Amendment, 
And the Second Amendment should have those limitations. Now, I, my concern right now is that this Supreme Court, and I'm going to say stuff that probably many of you will not agree with, but this Supreme Court is, is to me, reckless. They do not respect precedent. They do not respect the rule of law. And I will just say on a separate aside, three of those people swore under oath that they believed that, that uh, Roe v. Wade was settled precedent and if confirmed that they would support it. And they clearly lied. I think they lied about other things. And I think we have a real reckoning with the Supreme Court because um, you have people right now that, you know, whatever your political views, the Supreme Court is meant to be a neutral body that's meant to interpret law, not create law. And right now we have a court that is full of people that, you know, we all see as annexes of the Republican Party's most extreme right wing. And, and even if your politics are aligned with that, that's kind of dangerous because uh, this jeopardizes the balance of power between our three branches of government. And, and I think right now we have a, a, a serious crisis of confidence in the Supreme Court. We've got a lot of work to do to restore that confidence, to restore the way that our democracy is supposed to work. Oh, another question back here. First, I want to thank you for your support of the Orange Unified School District's uh, recent shenanigans. And this is from a parent and a teacher, and I'm also a teacher in Orange Unified, so we had the same question. And my name's Kathy, and she's Catherine. Uh, both, uh, both a teacher and parent is concerned with some of the decisions that the Orange Unified School District has been making. What are your thoughts? Sorry, the thoughts about the Orange Unified School District board and the, what are your thoughts and what are they doing? Um, yeah, so I, for those of you who weren't following, the Orange Unified School Board uh, has some new elected trustees um, and uh, immediately they called a emergency meeting. Uh, I think it was January 4th, so it was like while a lot of folks were on vacation or gone. Uh, and at that meeting they noticed that they would, uh, looking to suspend or terminate their superintendent and assistant superintendent. Um, Later in that meeting, they then announced that they would fire them and replace them with two people that they'd already decided on. And, and I think, um, and I, I guess should add that the superintendent and assistant superintendent had exemplary ratings. They never had any controversy. Um, I, I worry about the politicization of our schools and our school boards. Um, obviously, the OUSD board can make its own decisions, uh, but I should also add that they serve at the pleasure of the legislature, and that is something I made clear in a letter I wrote to the Orange Unified School Board's president. Um, <clears throat> they also have fiduciary duties to taxpayers and to students, um, and there is something called the Brown Act that they are supposed to follow, which uh, says that if you are going to meet, or if you're going to meet and decide business, you have to do it publicly with public comment. And the way that this went down raises serious concerns that they met ahead of time, that they communicated ahead of time. Uh, normally what happens is if you decide you don't like your superintendent, uh, as, as I think Trustee McEwen will tell you, you would first notice that. You'd have a hearing around the, the shortcomings of the, the uh, superintendent, why you might want to consider replacing them or terminating them. You'd then spend a, a couple more meetings you know, around that topic. Then you'd decide to vote to do that. And then later you might decide who you would replace them with. This would take months normally to decide. The fact that this school board did this in one meeting, right before the semester was supposed to start, is, is to me very suspicious on its face. Uh, I wrote a letter to them, I think two and a half weeks ago. I have not received a response yet to my knowledge. Uh, and so I am uh, considering my options. I have already talked to the Attorney General Rob Bonta about this. I've been in communication with uh, AG Spitzer, and, and we're considering our options, including a legislative audit, uh, but again, I would emphasize that, that they're, they're not an independent body. They serve at the pleasure of the legislature. Uh, they have duties that they're supposed to follow. There are laws they're supposed to follow. And we're, we want to make sure that they are following those laws, that they are respecting their duties. Uh, because this decision will, even if it was totally you know, merited, uh, it was rushed and it will cost the taxpayers millions of dollars. Uh, and all the way this went down, uh, to me, bothers me. And by the way, thank you for your service. I know it's a tough time to be a teacher. <laughs> well, um, uh, we have a few questions about AB 257. What is your position on the California Fast Food Accountability and uh, Standard Recovery Act? Oh, is this the last part? Uh, the, the, the Standards Recovery Act? Oh, yeah. Uh, AB 257 was probably the most controversial vote I've taken, and I want to explain it, because I did vote yes for this bill. 
It is a bill that establishes a fast food council uh, in this state, and um, I initially was, was uh, opposed to this bill. Um, but what I said to the bill's supporters and sponsors uh, was that if you modify the bill, and I mentioned earlier one of my roles in the state senate, I view, is to try to modify legislation that I, I think is going to pass to make it more amenable to businesses. And, and that, to me, is what happened here. This bill was going to pass uh, regardless of whether I voted for it or not. There were several other people that were lined up to vote for it. Um, and, and so one of the things we did was we emphasized to the, this bill sponsors that if you take away the three most onerous provisions, I will vote for it. Uh, one of those was uh, a joint liability for fast food franchises and franchisees. In other words, if you had a problem at your local McDonald's, you could sue the McDonald's headquarter. Uh, I had a real problem with that. I, that was one of the things I asked for. Uh, I, a limitless uh, authority and wages, that's another problem that we looked at. And uh, Anyways, long story short, I won't get into all the details, but they modified it, in fact, more aggressively than I'd asked for. Uh, it also has like a seven-year sunset, so the bill will expire, I think, in 2030. And if it's not renewed, if it's not, actually not renewed, if it's not actually uh, reauthorized by the legislature, it will not be in effect. So with those changes, uh, I gave my word that I'd support it. I believe in keeping my word, so I voted for it. It was a tough bill. I, I still hear from it. I still worry if it was the right vote sometimes. Uh, I, you know, am concerned about the effect on potential local franchisees. But that being said, uh, I, I made the promise, and, and, and this is one of the tough balancing acts I have to do as a legislature. Uh, I care about the fact that a lot of fast food workers are struggling. At the same time, I don't want businesses to leave the state. Uh, so this is an example of where you know, there's ro no roadmap for these types of decisions, but this is what I chose to do. I tried to make what I saw as a well-intentioned but bad bill better, and uh, in doing that, I, I felt comfortable with that, even if it is a controversial vote. Okay, we have a question from a resident from Tustin. Green jobs. As we switch to more renewable energy and environmentally sustainable practices, what type of jobs do you see being created in California? <clears throat> that's a great question. Um, what, do we, what, do we, what kinds of jobs will we get from the green economy? Uh, and that's a really, really important concern for me and a lot of my colleagues. Uh, but I think there's like a lot of potential for really cool jobs here. Uh, first of all, just the electric grid expansion that we're going to see is going to create lots, thousands, tens of thousands of, of uh, high-paying electrician jobs because we have to build out a grid. We have to expand the grid. We have to underground some of it. Uh, all these are important priorities. When we think about, it's not just solar panels, but you know, when we're talking about long duration storage, when we're talking about wind energy, a lot of jobs there to build those, to maintain those. Um, so I, I think we're really looking at, uh, you know, a lot of folks look at climate change as a, a problem. And it is a problem, but it's also an opportunity because I think we have the ability to create jobs. And by the way, also, if California becomes a green hub, which I think we will, if Orange County becomes a green hub, uh, you know, the, the possibilities, I think, are endless because we can be a green Silicon Valley. And we know the economy of the future is around green innovation. And, and so if we in this state, in this area, can help develop innovations around uh, efficiency, around storage, around some of the other problems we're facing in trying to get to a zero emissions economy, uh, we can not only solve our own problems here in the state, but we can export that technology around the world. And that you know, is, is trillions of dollars in economic benefits that we could take a huge part of. Good morning. This question comes from Danit from Orange on solar. Please address the decision by the California Public Utilities Commission regarding rooftop solar pricing changes coming this spring. What can we be doing to make our solar costs more equitable for schools, businesses, and residents of California? Uh, so this debate, how many of you guys have heard of net energy metering? Uh, so this decision by the CPUC is around net energy metering. Uh, and so if you have solar panels, what happens is that you can get a refund or rebate for how much solar you produce. That's offset against your overall utility bill. Um, and depending on when you purchase your solar panels, you might actually get money back from the utility company. Uh, now, the utilities have pushed hard against this for, you know, basically the entire existence of solar panels uh, because they, and their argument's not totally without merit. Their argument is they have to pay for storage. That when you produce your solar energy, it's during certain hours of the day. 
and that that is less valuable than energy that they need at certain hours of the day at certain times of the year. And so that you should not just be able to sell it one to one. Uh, and, and that they, f they argue also that this is inequitable because it benefits people who can afford solar panels over those who can't. And those who can't afford solar panels are people like many of us in this room who own our own homes, uh, who can afford to put up the 20000 or more that it costs to install your solar panels. And meanwhile, the, the lower income communities, the young people, the seniors who can't afford that or live in apartments don't benefit from those subsidies. Um, now, this is a challenging debate, but, but one of the reasons I've come down against what the CPUC is doing and support these subsidies uh, is because we need to encourage more rooftop solar regardless. We need more families, e even those who are well, well off, to be adopting solar. That's going to be critical because that, that phases it in more aggressively. And so last year, this came before the legislature, I voted uh, f for the bill that would have prevented net energy metering. I'm sorry, against the bill that would have ended net energy metering. I was one of a number of folks. We were able to kill that bill in the Senate. Uh, this time the CPUC came back and is trying to do it by rule. Uh, I think we're probably going to see a bill come out this year or next that will reverse what the CPU is doing, and I will, I will certainly support that. Uh, I think we do need more equity around some of the subsidies. It, to me, this is a real concern. Uh, we need to make sure that more of the subsidies we're giving flow to communities uh, that are lower income. At the same time, we can't discourage adoption of solar and other renewable energy. So uh, that, that's kind of my answer. Uh, let's make sure that like, those communities that are not benefiting get the benefits, but let's not take away the benefit that's encouraging adoption. So we'll, we'll do three more questions, and then we'll give you time to wrap, sir. Completely different topic from a resident from Costa Mesa on abortion rights. So the questioner asks, why did we add, add abortion rights to the state constitution when we know that abortion rights are safe in California? Uh, so Proposition 1 last year was on the ballot and that um, enshrines abortion rights in the California constitution. So first I just want to say I support abortion rights, full stop. Um, I am... Without getting too deep in the details, uh, I would just say I, I, I go to church. I'm a Christian. Uh, I know many of my fellow parishioners believe abortion is a sin. And maybe that's right. But what I think none of them believe, and I do not believe, is that abortion is murder. I do not think a, a six-week fertilized fetus is a human being. And I would challenge anyone to have a debate around that because that has huge consequences for our society. Uh, and, and I will say further that we don't legislate sins generally. We legislate harms to others. And, and that, I think the debate sometimes gets lost in this basic fundamental distinction. Um, a sin is not the same as murder, and we don't outlaw most sins uh, unless they hurt other people. Now, that being said, uh, to the question, um, I think the reason is twofold. One, it's in case we ever have a sea change here in California and, you know, through electioneering or, or undermining our democracy, we have a different type of majority, a different type of governor. Uh, one could imagine in the future that abortion rights could be in jeopardy. Uh, but I think also it's because of the weird way that the law works, which is uh, that constitutional rights are given more preference than laws. And while we have certainly legislated in the state uh, abortion rights, we have not made that part of the Constitution until last year. And so should the Supreme Court or any federal courts look at California and want to strike down our laws, having it in our Constitution gives us a little bit more protection. Now, I'll be honest, as I mentioned earlier, I think this court is reckless, outrageous, extreme, and having it in our Constitution may not be enough to stop them from overturning all our laws at some point. Um, but it does give us some protection, I think, legally, if, say, Congress decides to pass a federal abortion ban. Hello. We've had quite a few questions about both the housing and homelessness crisis. Can you discuss some of your visions on what the state is doing to meet the housing needs of those living in California? Uh, right now, the, the main proposals we've adopted, thank you for the question, because I didn't address homelessness before, and I should. Um, but the, some of the main things we've done is, is provide more funding for homeless housing, either temporary or permanent. Uh, and then I think on the housing side, we've kind of worked around the edges on things like lot splitting, more ADUs, more, more density. 
the proposals we voted on have been analyzed and, and like we're talking about at most with all the proposals that we voted on in the last few years, maybe 100,000 new units in California. So they're not enough to really move the needle. We're going to have to look to, to more stuff. Uh, on the homelessness issue, um, I've, I think I've visited something like eight homeless services providers in my time in the Senate. I've learned a lot about the issue. And the one thing I've learned is, is that there's many different types of homeless populations. Uh, there are people that are housing insecure. Y your rent goes up, you can't afford it, you start couch surfing, you start staying at a hotel, uh, you know, and, and then that leads to maybe down the line you're in your car, and then you lose your car, and then you're, you're on the street. So by the time you see someone on the street in a tent or walking around, uh, they've probably been housing insecure or homeless for months, maybe years. Uh, and, and that, of course, creates a ton of mental health issues. And that, of course, leads to substance abuse issues. And so these are all interrelated. Sometimes the driver is substance abuse. Sometimes it's mental health. Uh, sometimes it's housing insecurity that causes those. But they're all very interrelated. And it becomes this vicious cycle where if you're uh, homeless or you don't have a home, uh, you then turn to more drugs. You become riddled with more mental health issues. Uh, so the key here is you have to intervene early. You have to help people when they need that help. Because, and I know a lot of folks, you know, think about this as, as a giveaway. Like, you're, you're helping these people get housing. Uh, that, that makes no sense. That's not fair to me. I'm a taxpayer. Uh, but the argument I'd make is it's fiscally responsible because if you help someone for a few weeks or a few months at a time when they're really in need, uh, you can get, intervene at a, and prevent them from going down that pathway of substance abuse and mental health issues. And, and that means that they will be a functioning, tax-paying member of society, uh, not to mention the, just the, 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 the emotional and, and moral parts of, of just helping people in need. And so I think that's important. That's something we in the state are starting to learn. And so we're providing more money for transitional housing programs, things like that. Uh, and then, of course, we have down the scale, we have the problem of the people that are actually um, on the streets. Uh, they're talking to themselves. They've got m drug issues. And I, I recently did a tour of Costa Mesa with some uh, police officers, and they knew every homeless person by name. They knew their situation. Uh, they, they knew you know, this person might have a bad day like once every two months and have an incident. We have to be mindful of that. Um, but, but they really know their homeless population. With those folks, we have to intervene uh, a, a little bit more aggressively. We have to make sure they have housing, but also what's called wraparound services. They need someone checking on them to make sure that they're staying off drugs, that they're checking in with their counseling, uh, that they're um, you know, doing all the medical treatment that they're supposed to be doing. That, that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of resources. Um, but ultimately, I think that's something we need to start looking at and the state is starting to look at. Now, here in Orange County, we have some great programs. Be Well is doing some great work. We've got to you know, be, give it up for Be Well. They're, they're really cutting edge and they're seen as cutting edge around the state. And it is this wraparound model where they have housing, but they also have social services. Um, and, and so I think we need to do more in this state to, to try to make it easier for uh, housing providers, th those who cater to, to the housing insecure and homeless, uh, to be able to access not just housing funds, but some of the social services funds. And it's this weird thing where you, know, you think it's government money for a problem. It should be you know, seamless. But it's actually very difficult to access housing money and also social services money because they're different providers. It's, it's uh, you know, you have to talk to different people. There's different forms to fill out, different requirements you have to meet. Uh, it's actually quite difficult. And so we, I think, in the state need to focus on making it easier for those providers to access different forms of federal and state funding so they can address the problem. The other thing is that we've started looking to care courts. This is the governor's proposal last year. It's something I support. It, it is not without some controversy, uh, but there are people who refuse to be taken off the streets, and, and, you know, even if there's housing available. And, and I think this is inhumane to them because often they're so mentally um, ill that they're maybe not in their right state of mind. And so what Care Courts proposes to, do, proposes to do is create a fair process, a humane process by which uh, someone can be put into a housing shelter with wraparound services uh, even if they say they don't want it, it, it you need to, it, it's, a, it's a process. We're trying to make sure it's constitutional. It's still in formation right now. But, but I think we have to do that because uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's not fair to them to be cold on the street, uh, to be in this cycle of substance abuse and mental health. And by the way, they don't live that long either when, when they're in that situation. Um, and it's also, I think, important for our communities. You know, we shouldn't, you know, if there's housing available, if there's services available, 
you know, you don't want, there are families, particularly in LA, that, that walk out of their homes and their kids are dealing with gang activity, with drugs, things like that. It's, it's not fair to those households either. So uh, I think we have to do better on homelessness. Uh, the state is working to that, and I'm happy to support those efforts. Uh, next question right here. Don from Tyson has a question on recycling. What percentage of our plastic recyclables are actually recycled from our recycling bin? Currently, we're asked to, quote, wash and dry plastic containers before putting them in bins. I don't know the precise answer to that question, but I think it's pretty close to zero right now um, because China stopped accepting our plastics. Um, and so we are looking, there was a major bill passed last year uh, by my colleague Ben Allen that I was pleased to support. And it will create a new process for cycling in the state, uh, one that will, um, and it will take some time to develop, but it'll involve business uh, and, and recycling facilities. It'll create new recycling facilities to recycle things like plastic here in the state. It'll be funded uh, through different surcharges on different providers of, of plastics and other recyclable goods. Uh, and this is the, the biggest recycling uh, bill we've seen ever. It, it hopefully, I think it will lead to massive changes in the way we recycle. So hopefully, by the time it's implemented and, and, and people are used to it, it'll be close to 100% of our plastic gets recycled. But that's something we really do have to work on. And um, it, it's been a debate for years because we know we need plastics recycling facilities in the state, but it, it's not something that we've been able to find the funding for. It's, it's kind of expensive to do. Um, but yeah, we need to get plastics recycled because we know what happens when they go to landfills. We've got plastic particles up in places like Antarctica and the North Pole. They're all over. They're in our air. They're in our food. And we have to really reverse that trend. Uh, oh, looks like my mic is dying. So last question from uh, CEO Claudia. This... Uh comes from B. Walden. Uh, thanks you for being here. And the question is, what do you think your greatest challenge will be in your role this year? My greatest challenge in my role this year? Um, I think, one, just finding the time to do everything I want to do. Um, and I mean that seriously, because the committees I'm on, Judiciary, Energy, Budget, um, and uh, Natural Resources Chair, like those are really heavy committees. And we're going to deal with a lot of bills. Uh, and so time management is just a concern. I, I want to do everything. My, my staff will tell you up in Sacramento, I take on too many projects. I try to do too many uh, bills, including they don't want me involved in OUSD because they say I don't have the time. Um, and, and so uh, these are challenges to, to my personal life and, and, and sort of my goal of trying to represent this area and our values uh, in Sacramento and here locally. Uh, I think the biggest policy challenge I'm going to face is the budget because we are facing a shortfall. We don't yet know how big that's going to be. Uh, but I do want to make sure that we continue a dialogue with those of you who want to uh, around what your priorities are because we may have cuts this year. And for the first two years I was in office, uh, I did not have cuts. We had surpluses. But with cuts, we, we're going to have tough decisions to make potentially. And, and I want to make sure we're hearing from all of you on that. Uh, so I have one question I'll, I'll take from the audience here. I think then we've got to cut it off. And then I'm happy to talk with any of you. Uh, offline after this, and I'll just hang around. But thank you for showing up. Yes, ma'am. I also appreciate my diversity, because I can already tell that I'm a pilgrim and I'm holding my hands. Okay. Uh-huh. Fraud. Uh-huh. Okay? I think you're tossing around uh, this amount of money, this amount of money for this, for that. Why can't we commit fraud? We would get a lot of this money back. You mentioned the EDD. Yep.
much does we get sloppy. So I'm seeing yeah. future fraud now. We saw EDD fraud a couple years ago. They don't even know how much that was. 20 billion, 60 billion. Uh, we didn't do anything with it. We're not, we won't do anything You're with that card. How many others are out there that are going to? I appreciate the question, and first of all, I should say, I, I don't know your reference to unholy pilgrim and unholy land, but you're, you're welcome. Uh, I appreciate, as, as long as you live in, even if you didn't live in my district, you're, uh, you're welcome. Uh, what, what city do you come from, ma'am? Foothill Ranch. So I, I believe we represent part of Foothill Ranch, so you're in my district. So I uh, always welcome the opportunity to engage with my constituents. Um, as far as your question, and, and for those of you who might not have heard it in the back, it was just basically how do we prevent fraud? And there's been lots of examples of this with EDD, et cetera. Um, so there's kind of two topics I want to raise. First, uh, on EDD specifically, there's a California component and then there's just a national component. I sat as chair and founder of the Cybersecurity Select Committee in the State Senate. I, f I founded it because I've been a victim of identity fraud. Uh, as, a, as a former employee of the U University of California, Irvine, all my data and my kids' data were breached. I was a T-Mobile customer. I, they had a major breach. So my ki I get notices every, every few days that my kids' information, my information found on the dark web. My kids are going to have to go through life with their social security numbers and their addresses just being available to whoever wants to purchase it. Uh, part of the problem with that is that when you're, all that information is available, and, and probably two-thirds of Americans right now have their SSNs and addresses available for, you can purchase it for like a buck or two on the dark web, I'm told. Uh, I, I don't know from personal experience. Um, but the problem with that is that it's really hard to stop fraud. So we were not the only state that saw massive EDD type fraud uh, as they were rolling out those stimulus checks. Because it, if you're in prison, if you're a Russian hacker, it, you know, it's easy to impersonate a real person. You have all their information. The way we think about identity in this country is totally wrong. It's bizarre. But I, I could, I, if I, with just a few keystrokes and some Bitcoin, I could get all your data. I could impersonate you very easily because uh, I know where you lived, I know your employment history, I know your SSN, and that's what companies, including our credit providers, use to gauge whether I'm me. So that was the part that's universal. The part that's California specific is that our state agencies are way behind on technology, like way behind, like decades behind. Uh, and it's something I learned in my role in, in the Cybersecurity Select Committee. It's not just EDD. Most of our agencies are just operating old software, old computers, old programs. And there's lots of reasons for that, but it's, it's just the, our state bureaucracy is not very good. So we, we know we have a problem, and it's not just with EDD, it's not just with FTB, it's with a lot of our agencies, and it's, it's been something that folks have been trying to address for a while. Uh, now, I hate to say this because it sounds like we're throwing money at the problem, but part of the problem actually is money. There's not money there specifically for software upgrades, because you know what, my colleagues want to run bills that like, you know, get them headlines. And no one gets headlines for a bill that provides funding for software updates and cybersecurity. And it's been a chronic problem that we're, we're facing uh, in, in the state. And, and so that is something I don't know the answer to. I'll keep trying to push for better software, better security, better controls against fraud. But it's not going to happen overnight. And part of the problem is that California has 40 million people. We've, we have the largest bureaucracy of any state by far. Uh, not only because we have, you know, a bigger government per capita, but because we have the biggest population by far. Uh, so th there's all sorts of problems, and I agree with you. I don't have an easy answer for you, uh, and I'll just tell you, the problem is, is pretty systemic in California, and I, I, I'm at my wit's end around what we do about it, because we know there's, there, there's going to be future fraud. You're right. And, and I'd love to figure out how we can control that, but um, in the meantime, you know, we, we hold hearings, we do audits, we, we exercise the levers of power we have. But I do think the real answer is some kind of systemic upgrade of systems, of software, things like that. Thank you for the question. Uh, so thank you all for being here. I really appreciate you spending some time on a Saturday with me. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And I, I, I'm happy to stick around for a few questions if, if folks want to talk.